Hello, my beautiful bookish people. It has been about two and a half, three weeks since I last checked in with my reading. And technically I do have footage that I could edit together, but at this point it's kind of a mess. So I'm just gonna kind of do a synopsis of what I've been reading. <music> After Legendborn, I read The Sad Ghost Club by Liz Liz Middings. Um, as you can see, this is what the art looks like. It's also very similar to what you'd expect inside of the book. I felt so seen in this graphic novel. <laughs> because it talks a lot about anxiety and depression and while they aren't exactly ghosts they're kind of like people who feel like they don't belong in the world and that's how they visually show it is because sometimes your anxiety or your depression or your mental health you just feel like you don't fit <laughs> and then you can kind of recognize it in other people and like start conversations about it because you know you always need a friend and there's probably someone out there going through it too that you can talk to and it was just a really fun graphic novel about those things so if you're looking for that then i'd highly recommend checking this book out next i read the girl who drank the moon by kelly barnhill and this is a middle grade book. It is more towards younger middle grade, I think. Like, I don't know, when I grew up reading, I, I also had like a really weird reading journey. But basically, like, I think I started with Aesop's Fables and then chapter books like Junie B. Jones and the such, and then Boxcar Children and then The Phantom Tollbooth and Nancy Drew and like some more of the children's classics and whatever. I think this book would fit in right around that uh, area of maybe just after Nancy Drew and right around the same time you'd give a kid the Phantom Tollbooth. Um, unlike the Phantom Tollbooth, I like I still find the Phantom Tollbooth to give me new outlooks on life every time I read it. This one is definitely written much more for a younger audience and specifically for that younger audience and we definitely need books like that and I appreciate that it's just as an adult reading it I'm not sure you'll get the same out of it as reading it as a child but I'd be totally interested to see in like several years do the kids who grew up reading this get super nostalgic reading it now like I do for the Phantom Tollbooth because I had fond memories of it in my childhood. But um, in this book there is a town or a small city. It's it's weird because it's set in kind of a, like a medieval type setting but also they know what atoms are so it's kind of that storybook-esque kind of deal where you obviously fill in your modern knowledge to figure out things in the story, but it doesn't necessarily fit in the setting the story is in, which is fine. That's just a thing to be aware of. And anyways, there's this small uh, city and for a long time they have been sending a child, the youngest child at a certain time of year, into this forest and they leave it as a sacrifice to the witch but the witch has been rescuing these children that have been left in the woods because she doesn't know why they're being left in the woods but she like sees children being left in the woods doesn't want them to be eaten by wild animals and then she whisks them away and feeds them starlight after she runs out of her goods as she goes through this long trek through this long big forest to these other cities across the way and she gives families uh, these star children because they're a good fit for each other and she just keeps getting babies every year and she doesn't know why. So there is a mystery afoot as to why that is happening. 
Um, hi, editor Victoria here. I completely forgot to say that on one of her journeys of feeding the children Starlight, the witch gets really enamored by one child in particular and doesn't pay attention to what she's drawing down from the sky and pulls down moonlight, which is significantly more magical, which means that she now needs to take care of this child because magic and young children who don't know how to control it can be very dangerous. So we get to see the child who drank the moonlight grow up and kind of discover what's afoot and fixes it throughout the story. As in a lot of uh, children's stories, there's not a whole lot of depth to the villains in this book but you know, that's fine. There's a lot of implied things that are good and implied things that are bad. I kind of wish they'd explained a little bit more of why the bad things are bad, but it's a really cute story. As you can see, I had many enjoyable moments, many good laughs, several good quotes, but also several things that didn't make a whole lot of sense to me even though I know why they're there, if that makes sense with that whole, I wish they'd have gone into more backstory here, but also that's me talking as an adult reader <laughs> and wanting that sort of thing because I like big, thick, chonky books, which we'll get into in a second because I also picked up uh, the Farseer trilogy since I last checked in. The next book I read was an arc from NetGalley, which I got in exchange for an honest review of Gudetama, Mindfulness for the Lazy by Eugene Clark. And if you like Gudetama, you're probably going to like the book. It covers mindfulness, as it says, and it covers like several talking points. Let me check my notes. It goes over living in the present and saying hello to be connected to others and how that can be a fulfilling thing and being self-aware of where you are in relation to others so like personal space and how everybody's personal space bubble might be a little bit different than yours it covers pre-visualization and hitting pause to recharge when stressed out and unfocused doing things the way you would want them done, regardless of if anyone around you would do it that way. The meanings between sympathy and empathy. And if you're not good at remembering things, set yourself reminders. Um, try to look at things from many different angles before saying something, because you know, just because you view something one way doesn't mean that everybody else will. And when dealing with problematic people, you don't have to answer them. You can block them, not respond, or choose to respond. And napping is also a form of self-care. Some of these things they showed in a more happy light, they do touch on feeling down and having sad moments to a degree. I just wish that they had covered that in its own individual comic panel as well. But, you know, overall they did include it, which a lot of people don't in mindfulness for some reason, and I don't know why, but I did thoroughly enjoy this and would recommend it if you're looking for some good Atama books. The next book I read was a library read of The Fire Never Goes Out by Noelle Stevenson. Like at, at the end of every year for a while now, she's kept comics kind of going over what happened in that year and a little bit of reflection. And this book is a culmination of that and kind of explaining her life story and her struggles to get to where she is today. So if you like Noelle Stevenson's work and would like to know a little bit more about her personal side of things, then totally check out The Fire Never Goes Out. Next, I read another library checkout of Sunstone Volume 1, and 
I'm just gonna have something say the name for me, so. We stand some lesbian BDSM representation, but like, I have never read a graphic novel this wordy before. It is really wordy, and the font is so small, so teeny tiny, that it made it very difficult to read. I almost wish that they had done the comic panel, like, with a little bit of dialogue and then off to the side had another like wall of text so that you can get the whole thing. I don't know. I didn't mind the story that much. Like the beginning was a little weird because it's like, no wait, hold on. Um, you're gonna like this book because it has this stuff in it. And I get that they're adapting a web series, but I wish that they had changed the opening a bit because it feels like a web series in a book where they're like, wait, don't click away, come back. And it's like, bruh, I'm reading the book. I'm here for the book. You don't have to like beg me to stay and read your book. I'm, I got the book. You know what I mean? But I just, it's so tiny and it gave me a headache and I don't think I can continue with the series because it hurts to read it physically, which sucks because I like that we have that representation in a graphic novel, but man, I'm not gonna go through another headache to keep up with the series. Next we have Far Sector issue 11 by N.K. Jemisin, and as with pretty much all things N.K. Jemisin, I love it. <laughs> um, it's starting to get really intense and starting to wrap up, and I think there's a few more issues left before this storyline wraps up, so I'm very excited to see where it goes, and also I'm very salty that I started the series before it ended because I would highly recommend binge reading it, but also I'm happy that I'm getting to experience a comic as it's coming out for once because I haven't really done that much because I usually prefer to just binge read everything. So it's interesting. It's teaching me patience. Next I read an audio copy of White Fang by Jack London and I mean as with all classics at this point like are what are the classics that aren't like super racist and sexist and just not good life lessons? <laughs> because like you're reading a story about a wolf told from a wolf's perspective. Why is the wolf racist and classist? What? What? Why? <laughs> Just why? Would I recommend anyone read this? No. What would I recommend people read if you want something told from a wolf's perspective? The Farseer Trilogy by Robin Hobb. It's, uh, like, why, why a wolf gotta be racist? It doesn't even feel like a wolf. Like, it would have been one thing if at least it had had the feel of a wolf. But I don't think Jack London ever observed animals that much because, like, it sounds like someone who read about an animal and tried to describe it at length, but they haven't actually watched the animal interact with stuff. I'm just saying. Robin Hobb, on the other hand, has definitely seen a dog and other canines and how they interact because it, it she actually can write from a doggo's perspective. <laughs> so I'd highly recommend picking up The Assassin's Apprentice, Royal Assassin, and Assassin's Quest. And I am very glad that all of these books in this trilogy are out because the cliffhangers in between them are something, let me tell you. They are, whew, but I think, oh, it's gonna be hard to pick my favorite author now because Robin Hobb does such a good job with like classic high fantasy showing characters from many different angles. Like, Yes, the main character is male and he has like an assassin quest line though, even though they're all assassin books and he does assassin things, it's not just about the killing like a lot of other assassin books I've read. In, in fact, it's very much not just about the killing. 
but what's really neat about Robin Hobb's characters is that they are very rich and well developed and the side characters make sense for what they're doing and how they're shown and she has fantastic female representation and even dare I say non-binary representation back in 1995? Like what? <laughs> character that they go wait are you male or are you female and they just come back and say why does it matter whether I'm male or female ooh woo woo I'm gonna make jokes about how you can't decide what gender I am and that is for some reason that decides how you're gonna treat me and this is dumb and I'm like yes <laughs> the fool is by far my favorite character and I'm very glad that the fool gets a series later on in this series because Boy, am I looking forward to it. <laughs> but um, I read the back of this book in my April TBR video, but what I didn't do was read the original book synopsis for the first book. So I'm going to go back and read that to you because that'll give you a better representation of what to expect in this one. And I will say the first 44 pages were a bit slow for me, but after that I was hooked. It starts as magical realism in this book. You start leaning towards high fantasy in this book. And at this point you're getting a lot of high fantasy elements while still keeping some of that magical realism too. In a faraway land where members of the royal family are named for their virtues they embody, one young boy will become a walking enigma. Born on the wrong side of the sheets, Fitz, son of chivalry farseer, is a royal bastard, cast out into the world, friendless and lonely. Only his magical link with animals, the old art known as the wit, gives him solace and companionship. But the wit, if used too often, is a perilous magic, and one abhorred by the nobility. So when Fitz is finally adopted into the royal household, he must give up his old ways and embrace a new life of weaponry, scribing, courtly manners, and how to kill a man secretly as he trains to become a royal assassin. So if any of that sounds at all like a fun time for you, definitely check this series out because as you can see, I thoroughly enjoyed them. And these are by far in my uh, top five <laughs> fantasy series now. Next, I read Stardust by Neil Gaiman via an ebook copy. And if you're looking for a whimsical fairy tale written for adults, it definitely delivers on that front. And if you want the synopsis for the book, check out my April TBR video. The one thing that I kind of wish wasn't done for this book is that it's set way back when it's either like late 1800s, early 1900s, somewhere around in there, I think. Editor me back again. It's set in 1856 and in like... 1830 something at 1.2 but mostly 1856. I'm trying to remember this two weeks later and my memory is not that good. <laughs> Anyways, I it the language in it is used correctly for the historical setting but I'm not quite sure that we need a lot of language around English imperialism still being written today if it's not only for historical context like man some of that language i don't think was necessary for the story though it was correctly used i just eh, you know whatever like is it a whimsical fairy tale for adults absolutely i gave it three stars i'm not mad at it i'm not gonna read it super often. I am still waiting for the video to become available through my library because I have waitlisted it. I'm just waiting for whoever to return it and then I'll watch it. 
to see if maybe I like the movie adaptation better. I probably will. And the last book that I've read since I've checked in is Marked by PC and Kristen Cast. And this is the first book in the House of Night series, which I never read originally when they were coming out. I've been told that this is very Twilight-esque, and man, we're... they're not kidding. I... do I have any good things to say about this book? Hmm? <laughs> the only good qualities might be bullying bad, cats are adorable, and the power of friendship. Because the rest of this book is just so ridiculously problematic. Like, did anyone with textured hair ever read this book? Because the way that hair is described is deeply concerning to me. <laughs> the way that the um, POC characters are portrayed is like, what? <laughs> just, <laughs> what? <laughs> What? <laughs> I don't think any people of color worked on this book because what? <laughs> Who let this shit pass? Why was this a popular series? I mean, I'd say the same thing about Twilight now, and I liked Twilight when it came out because, like, maybe these series had to walk first so that the actual good stuff can fly now because, like, Clearly, this book has its place in history with making YA fantasy popular and creating a market for that. But would I recommend anybody read these books now? Absolutely not. There are so many better books out there. And I just, like, they talk about Cherokee heritage. But they don't actually talk about Cherokee heritage, and I don't understand why. And like parts of this book, I looked up other reviews, parts of this book are just straight up plagiarized. I'm like, oh, that's, that's not good. That's not good at all. I don't know if I want to continue with the series or not, because there are so many better books out there that are much more worth my time. But also by the time I got to the very end of this book, I was minorly intrigued to go on because I kind of like where the story is going, but I've also heard that the story just falls off the rails after like the fourth book and there's 12 <laughs> and I'm not sure I want to put myself through that, but if I can get audio copies from the library and stick them on three times speed, I might just because I'm slightly intrigued to see where this goes. But yeah, no, would not recommend this series whatsoever. I'm now in the middle of reading a couple of different books. I'm currently on Vasilisa by Julie Matheson and I'm working on getting back into it. I think I'm just still having a book hangover from the Farseer trilogy because I loved the Farseer trilogy so much and I'm salty that I don't have more books in this series just yet, but I will be collecting them. Don't worry, I will have them all in my collection because I've heard that the Robin Hobb books just get better and better with each series. So I'm really hoping that I get that out of it as well. And then also to kind of, not to counteract, but also to counteract Marked, for its ridiculous representation, and lack thereof, rather. I'm also reading We Had a Little Real Estate Problem by Cliff Nesteroff, which I, I guess they put Cliff Nesteroff on the book because he's the main guy who went around and collected all the stories and worked with people to make the book happen. But also this is more of an anthology and kind of a history. It's hard for me to place what this book is other than reading like the f the first few pages out of it. So if you're in a bookstore or if you're like on Amazon and you get access to the first few pages of the book, go ahead and read that. Read the author's note because the author's note completely explains what exactly this book is. 
and the author's note is only about three pages so if you're out and about and you see this book definitely pick it up and read the author's note to see if it's something you would like to pick up because this very much is given me a history lesson and it's actually told from the point of view of people who actually experienced it and not by some random person trying to write people of color without doing any research <laughs> or you know not plagiarizing so that's good. I originally picked this book up because Bear over at Etu Brody recommended this book because I think they had gotten an ARC copy of it and really liked the representation in it. So I'm excited to get into this and I think I'm going to read it slowly over many days just so I can take my time with it and I'm gonna see if I can get my partner to read it with me because he also likes history books and this is very much up that alley because they've also given me other books that I've really enjoyed on similar themes. Um, let me see if I can think of the name of that other book. If you're if you've read The Heartbeat of Wounded Knee Native America from 1890 to the Present by David Dreher and you're looking for another read, I'd highly recommend picking this book up. And if you haven't picked either book up, I'd recommend both. Hi again. I kind of went on a rant here for a little while and I decided to cut most of it out. But here's basically the gist of that whole rant that went on for like 10 minutes. Mm, yep, that this is a thing. Like, I, I don't get it. Why are politicians saying, yes, I, I am part percentage of this tribe, but I don't suffer from anything that the tribes suffer from because I am way too white for that. But I'm not going to do anything to help the people that I'm claiming I'm from, even though I would be livid if I was stuck under those situations. Well, I'm going to end the video there. If you've made it this far, leave me a little chick emoji or like, a different bird, I don't know, or just leave the word bird down in the comments section below because my birds are screaming in the background and hopefully they've not been too loud. Also, if you have any book recommendations for Native representation and or Indigenous people's books, I'm looking to expand my library on that, so please let me know and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!